So, Father, as we come in Jesus' name and through his blood, we thank you for the open heaven here, your glory. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming to anoint and empower this time as you speak through me everything that needs to be said. Lord, we stand on that. We thank you, Lord, for speaking through me everything that needs to be said tonight under a mighty anointing. And that even now, the precious Holy Spirit will go and move upon your people, those that are going to be listening, to help us, to get locked in and focused, to give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus, and our hearts and minds will be good soil for the word. As you speak through me, your word like living seeds of truth sown into good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, take root, grow, and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. Let the winds of your spirit, Lord, we pray, carry this out among the nations and accomplish what it's supposed to. And, Lord, we stand on the promise that your word will not return void, but it will go forth and accomplish that which you sent it forth to do. And the birds of the air try to steal the seed. But, Lord, we take authority as a church. We submit this unto you. We resist the devil. We must flee anything that would try to hinder this word from getting where it's supposed to and accomplishing what it's supposed to. We command you to be bound right now in Jesus' name. We break your power. We cancel your assignments. You will back off right now in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I thank you for your angels just clearing the air from any resistance of the enemy. And that this will be a powerful time in the word. And we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many guys have been enjoying the historic revivals? Been getting something out of it? Learned some things maybe you hadn't heard before? These are things I believe that really need to be taught among God's people because not only does it increase our faith, but it helps us to believe God to see it in our generation. If God can do it in times past, he can do it now. If he could use imperfect vessels then, he can use imperfect vessels now. And we need a great move of God today, probably like no other time, because we're in the last of the last days before Jesus comes. And I believe that we're going to see it. The Bible promises us that he will pour out his spirit in the latter days on all flesh. And I do believe that there's going to be one more great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will finish what needs to be done. It'll get us ready to meet the Lord in the air. It'll purify the church, and it will cause the harvest to come in. And it's, it takes the move of the Holy Spirit because we can keep on with all of our efforts. And we may see somebody saved here and there, kind of like when you go fishing with a pole. But when the Holy Spirit comes and pours out his spirit, you have to break out the fishing nets because the harvest is great. And that's what we must have. We must have the Holy Spirit to see this end time harvest come in. So tonight, as I'm looking at this, the scripture that came to me and, and kind of what I wanted to focus on more than anything else, Isaiah 56, verse 7, Jesus quoted this when he said, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Have you ever noticed that you can get people to come to a lot of things, but when you have prayer meetings, it thins, in, thins out the crowd, doesn't it? But yet, the emphasis was not that these other things aren't good, but the Bible doesn't say my house will be called a house of of evangelism or discipleship or, or a social gathering, all these other things, and, and all that has its place, and there's a lot of good. But the Bible puts the emphasis on prayer because when we pray, there's going to be fruitfulness. There's, there's going to be an efficacy in what we're doing. There's going to be this power in things that, that will break through. It, it will get, that's what we need, and you're going to see that in the life of Finney. Charles Finney was a great intercessor himself, but he had other intercessors, and, and you'll see this as we go, that is what made the difference. How many knows that a praying Christian is a powerful Christian? And a prayerless Christian is usually weak and defeated in many ways. A praying church is a powerful church, but a church that doesn't pray usually has problems, and it's not very powerful. Prayer is the key. Jesus, when he lived his life upon the earth and walked these, uh, you know, for those three and a half years of ministry, the disciples saw that. They saw Jesus seem to go from one place of prayer to the next place of prayer. In his own personal walk before the Father, he would spend time in prayer. And then they saw the outworking of that. They saw the miracles, etc. And so they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he did. But that was the key. And when you see the early church, what do you see a lot going on is a lot of prayer. And so prayer is the key to seeing the power of God released in the earth and the advancement of the purposes of God. Like I've talked about many times, and last week as well, Joel 1 and 2. The locusts of the militaries came in against Israel, but when they prayed, he said, call a solemn assembly. When they began to pray and fast, 
That's what caused the armies to be retreating, and that's what caused the restoration of the years the locusts have eaten. And how many knows we need the restoration right now? I, I look at what was. Um, I guess I'm old enough to have seen what was and what is, and I'm grieved at seeing certain things, the lack of holiness, the lack of the fear of the Lord, and the lack of powerful prayer and revival today. And it's sad when you've seen that and then you see it not there. But God is the God of great restoration. If he can find a people that will pray and fast, God will, will through them and others, but he will rebuild the ancient ruins. He will raise up again the age-old foundations, repair the breach. He will do it. He's a God of restoration. Amen? All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, the life of Finney as he was toward the latter part of the Second Great Awakening. So remember the Second Great Awakening, the First Awakening, Mid, mid to late 1700s, well, mid 1700s, whenever Wesley and Whitfield and others were seeing a great move of God, then that began to wane, probably because of the uh, Revolutionary War. I mean, war is hor horrible. It really affects uh, people's lives, you know. But anyway, on the other side of that, pe the, the people here in America had backslidden, gotten away from God. James McGreedy began to really pray, get others to pray. The Red River Revival broke out, and it led into Cambridge. It's a second great awakening, right? But that continued on. So let me just read what I have. As, as Cambridge ended in 1801, seven days of blazing, white-hot fires of revival, tens of thousands of people encountering God in an awesome way in a field. As that waned after seven days, the revival continued to burn like wildfire. People that lived there in that time said that it was like winds blowing in a field, causing the fire just to keep going and spreading. It's a revival fire spread throughout the colonies of that time. Great leaders like Peter Cartwright, who was a great uh, circuit writer, but also many other Methodist circuit writers were evangelizing the homesteads. Remember me talking about those that would go from homestead to homestead, preaching the gospel. There were some during the Second Great Awakening that spoke in tongues. They were hit by the power. They went out of the power. There were powerful manifestations of the Holy Spirit, people shaking, laughing, weeping, um, people falling out of the power, being out for hours. Um, but also there was speaking in tongues. This revival caused the Methodists of that time to become spirit-filled. Unfortunately, there were church leaders that didn't know how to handle the move of God. All of a sudden in their church, they would come together and there'd be people fall out under the power and they're out for hours. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to handle it. And so the revival was lost in some places, but still the revival was burning bright where people were gathering for camp meetings, where people embraced the move of God in their church. The Holy Spirit was moving mightily. But how many knows that you've got to have a good wineskin to handle that? If, if God begins to move and you don't know what you're doing, and you don't know how to handle it, and you begin to shut it down, then the move of God's going to be lost in your church. And they were people that experienced that. Their old wineskin couldn't handle the new wine. Also, as always the case, the religious resisted and spoke against the move of God. Has there ever been a move of God where the religious did not persecute it? Of course not. They've always been the greatest persecutors. We pray for a move of God, but you need to count the cost because there's going to be the religious Pharisees and Sadducees of today that will say it's the devil and come up against the move of God. They always have. But as revival was going forth in power, um, around 1820s, God began to shift gears. I'll show you. God began to mightily move through the life of Charles Finney. One writer spoke of Finney in this way. He said when he opened his mouth, it was like aiming a gun, and when he spoke, the bombardment began. The effects of his speaking were almost unparalleled in modern history. People felt it. How many knows when it's anointed, you don't just hear it, you feel it? That's what it was. Over half a million people were saved through this man's life. Isn't that amazing? In a time before modern conveniences, there wasn't the Internet. There wasn't uh, vehicles to get places. This man saw such a move of God. But I'll tell you why, because he was a man of fervent prayer. 
And also in an age when there was no amplifiers for mass communications, he spearheaded a revival that literally altered the course of history. Finney was born a year after John Wesley died. He was 6'2", he was athletic, he was impressive, an impressive frontiersman from a totally non-Christian farming family. So he had zero church background, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing per se. Let me tell you why. Sometimes Christians that have grown up in church can be really religious. They don't mean to be, but they can be whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. They know how to act and talk, but yet there's things that aren't quite right. Sometimes God saving somebody, you know, I think about that with my wife. You know, she came from a completely non-Christian family. And so I don't see and I never have seen any religious spirit in my wife's life. She just loves the Lord. And I believe that childlike faith and that simplicity is what Finney had. Now, Finney was musically inclined, but he was also very athletic. He was also very intelligent, but he was also a heathen. (laughs) Finney studied to be a lawyer. During his studies, though, he was shocked at how much the law books he was reading kept referring back to the Bible as a reference for making laws and a reference of standards of morality. And so this caused him to read the Bible just simply out of curiosity. As he read the Bible, he began to realize in his own words how much of an infidel that he really was. Now, his new birth was very much like Derek Prince. I I was shocked because I know Derek's story. Derek Prince was in an army bunks back in the 40s, and the Holy Spirit, I mean, he was just reading the Bible because he wanted, he said, look, I'm a philosopher, but if I'm going to be a good student of philosophy, I'm going to have to read the most red book in all the world history. And what is it? The Bible. And he says, for me to just be able to be fair, he said, I'm going to have to read the Bible. So he read it. But the problem was, is that he began to have an encounter with God and God fell upon him and he got saved. And then after that, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was, it was almost identical to what happened to Finney. So in 1821, while reading the Bible, Finney was under a deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. The frontier revival was still happening through circuit riders and places of worship that desired the move of the Holy Spirit and places that were still continuing to have camp meetings. This was the birth of camp meetings was Cane Ridge. Finney, being under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, snuck out in the woods after being in deep conviction, and he was praying and seeking God. Upon his return, his boss had gone away to lunch. And so he began to play the bass violin and sing hymns. And he said in his journal, he said, It seemed as if my heart were all liquid. My feelings were in such a state that I could not hear my own voice and singing without causing my sensibility to overflow, meaning he was weeping. I tried to suppress the tears, but I could not. Later on, he helped me. Uh, Later on, he helped his boss relocate his office. Then, after that, he rushed back in to the room to finish seeking God. Isn't that something? The Holy Spirit was moving upon him. And let me tell you that in days of revival, there was a story, there was a lady recounting this story that during a time when the Holy Spirit was being poured out in general, she said it was really interesting because she was a part of a youth group of a church where God was not moving at that church at all. And here they were in a youth group and they, they were just worshiping the Lord as they do. And she said, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just fell on them. And she said there was around a dozen of them that were just radically saved that day. And she was telling this story. She was saying, I didn't understand why this happened to us just out of the clear blue. And it's interesting, Derek Prince was recounting this, and he, he answered the question. He said, because it was a time of outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that was happening on a broad scale. And you were one of the ones the Holy Spirit just simply fell upon and drew to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And the same thing happened to Finney. This was just a time of revival. And he didn't understand what was going on. He just simply started reading the Bible. And the Holy Spirit came upon him in such conviction, it drove him in the woods to pray. And he comes back in this office, and he, he's playing and singing, and he's just... He's weeping, and his boss, I need your help. And so he goes, helps him to move the office and all that. And the first thing he does is get back in there. 
and seek God. And while this was happening, as he's praying and seeking God, he stated there was no fire, there was no light in the room. Nevertheless, it appeared to me as if I were perfectly light, if it were perfectly light, rather. The whole room lit up with God's presence. He said, as I went in and shut the door after me, it seemed as if I met the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. It did not occur to me, nor did it for some time afterward, that it was wholly a mental state. In other words, the Lord wasn't physically there, but to him it was so real. It was like Jesus was physically there, but he wasn't. He said, on the contrary, it seemed to me that I saw him as I would see any other man. He said nothing, but he looked at me in such a manner as to break me down right at his feet, and it seemed to me a reality that he stood before me, and I fell down at his feet and poured out my soul to him. I wept aloud like a child and made such confessions as I could with a choked utterance. In other words, it was hard to pray because he was weeping so hard. It seemed to me that I bathed his feet with my tears, yet I had no distinct impression that I actually touched him. Later on, Finney continues the story. This was another time. He said, a mighty baptism in the Holy Ghost, without any expectation of it, without having the thought in my mind that there was any such a thing for me, he said, waves of love and power swept over him. A church choir member heard him weeping so loudly. She came and knocked on his door to check on him and asked him if he was sick and needed help. He said, no. He said, I'm fine, but I'm so happy I can't live. <laughs> After this, Finney had a strong call to ministry. Isn't that awesome? Just a supernatural encounter for both the salvation experience and the baptism in the Holy Ghost. The next day, each encounter with the lost. Now, this was interesting. After the baptism in the Holy Spirit... Finney, he says, the next day, he encountered people. He said, each encounter with the lost led to a powerful conviction and a new birth. How many knows we need to see this again? I remember there was a story where Catherine Coleman was up on stage. She had a minister, and she was at this hotel or whatever, and she was ministering. The Holy Spirit was mightily moving, and to usher her out, they had to take her behind the stage, and she was going out through the kitchen area. These people were not a part of the meeting at all. They hadn't been in there. She goes through the kitchen where they're chopping up veggies and stuff. She goes through the kitchen to leave, and she kept hearing thud, thud, thud. They were all just falling out under the power behind her. So the next day after Finney had the Holy Spirit upon him so powerfully like that, he goes out, listen to this. The first man he spoke to was his boss. He's just talking to, and this boss of his was the judge in the city. He was a powerful man, a wealthy man, and an important man. But as he talked to him, his boss was struck with such a conviction of sin that he couldn't look directly at Finney. And later he went into the same woods Finney prayed at and got saved. Isn't that awesome? Finney didn't even preach to him. But see, that's kind of what I've been trying to talk about a lot in this series is how supernatural the new birth really is. It's the conviction and draw of the Holy Spirit. See, if we're not careful, we start trying to dissect things and we start trying to create methods. And if you do this, if you pray this way, and then if you do this, this, and this, you're saved. That doesn't necessarily mean they're saved just because they do all those things. Salvation is a born-again experience. It's supernatural. And then it says the second visitor that came to Finney was actually a client of his. He was a lawyer, right? Came to him as a client. He was so convicted of sin that he also prayed to accept the Lord. Then Finney crossed paths with a universalist, and his, the universalist arguments were demolished, and also the universalist headed over the fence out into the same woods to get saved also. The first three people Finney ran into all got saved because of the power of God that was emanating off of him to convict them. So Finney knew that God was lead, leading him to leave his legal profession for the ministry. He refused to adhere to the prevailing Calvinist doctrine, but he preached holiness. Now, I agree with both Wesley and Finney personally. I am, I am not a Calvinist, although I do believe that God knows all things, and I know that he knows the end from the beginning, and he knows who are his. I understand that. But 
Finney did not believe extreme Calvinism. Extreme Calvinism would teach this, and I've said it many times. There's 10 people born, five are predestined to go to heaven, five are predestined to go to hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way it is. If they're predestined for heaven, they'll find the Lord. If they're not, they never will, even if you witness to them. You see what I'm saying? That's extreme Calvinism. Also, Calvinism has produced a once save, always save mentality. And so Finney did not adhere to that. I don't either. And Finney believed that free will, that when we preach to people, they have a free will to accept the Lord. And he also preached holiness. See, if you believe extreme Calvinism, then why would you even pray about anything ever? Because, I mean, what is going to be is just going to be. If you're an extreme Calvinist and you think that people, that are, it's, they're either going to be saved or they're not and all that, why would you ever witness to one single person and waste your time? If they're predestined to hell, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. If they're predestined to heaven, it doesn't matter if you witness to them. Do you see what I'm saying? Though this is not a true teaching here. And so Finney didn't like it. He didn't adhere to it. He believed that if we pray that God the Holy Spirit will move and convict people, he believed that man has a free will, and they do, to accept the Lord. All right. So he preached holiness. This holiness, now listen to this, because Finney preached holiness, it caused that of 80% of the people that were saved under his ministry never even backslid. Listen to that. That's important. See, when people preach extreme Calvinism and they get this once they've always say people get loose in their uh, view of, well, you know, I can go out and do whatever I want and still go to heaven type of attitude, you see. But when you preach holiness and the fear of God, it's different. People know, now wait a sec, I can't just do whatever I want to do and go to heaven one day. We've got to live holy. And the Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Finney, basically, his teaching, I feel it as I'm preaching here in this region, it blasted up against and broke through religious demons. Religious demons, and I say this in love, traffic very strongly through that extreme Calvinism type of mentality. But Finney preached the pure gospel with authority and power, he preached deep repentance of sin and holy living, and he was denounced by the wicked and the religious. So listen, if you're really going to be anointed and used of God, you can, prompt, you can just mark it down that there's going to be some wicked and some religious that just hate you. And that's just the way it is. And Finney was no exception. But Finney knew that prayer was the key to power. And so Finney himself was a great prayer warrior. He would spend hours sometimes in deep prayer and fasting. I wish I could have found the story because I want to just read it, but I'll tell you the gist of it. There was a time, for example, Finney went out in the woods for a season of prayer and fasting. And after he was done, he was going into a city, and he was going to rent something to be able to minister there. And as he walked into the building, if I remember the story correctly, there were people there. It was a place that was a business where they sewed fabric. But I can't remember the specifics about that. But as he walked in and he was talking to the owner, he was trying to rent the place. As he was talking, he heard various sounds. And as they were talking, he stopped and he started looking around as the people that were there couldn't sew or whatever anymore because the Holy Spirit had fell upon them. Some of them were weeping. They were under conviction. As he walked in there, he understood as he went in prayer and fasting, got alone with God, that the Holy Spirit would move in power and convict the lost. So he himself was a great prayer warrior, but also God gave him a man by the name of Daniel Nash. Now, Daniel Nash, in some ways, he was a preacher in his own right, but he wasn't an extrovert. He was somewhat reserved, and God really had his hand on him for prayer more than preaching. And there was also a man by the name of Abel Clary. Those two men became great and mighty intercessors for Finney. They earnestly prayed, and 
many times they would go to where Finney was or where he was going to go, and they would pray. Other times they prayed back where they were, but nonetheless, these men were great men of prayer. And because of their prayers, the harvest field broke open. And let me tell you, um, the, the intercessors are the greatest key to revival. That's why the devil many times tries to resist intercessors um, and make them ineffective because of that reason. So they traveled with Finney many times, or at least before him to pray. And on one occasion, this is again from Finney's journals. He wrote this. This is awesome. So here's how the story goes. On one occasion, when I got to a town to start a revival, Finney's telling the story. He said, a lady contacted me who ran a boarding house, and she said, Brother Finney, do you know a man by the name of Father Nash? She said, he and two other men have been at my boarding house for the last three days, and they haven't eaten a bite of food. I opened the door to peep in on them because I kept hearing them groaning, and I saw them lying down on their faces. They being this way for three days, lying prostrate on the floor groaning, I thought something awful must have happened to them, and I was afraid to go in, and I didn't know what to do. Would you please come and see them? And Finney responded, no, it isn't necessary. They just have a spirit of travailing prayer. Finney stated that Brother Nash was so earnest in his prayers that he would sweat profusely, even if it was freezing cold outside, and at times would pray until sheer exhaustion overtook him. Now, here's, here's the key. Finney viewed revival this way. Finney did not view revival as something mysterious. This is the way he viewed revival. He stated that if a farmer went out into a field and he plowed the field and he sowed seed into the field and the rains came, he was to expect that that harvest would come up, wouldn't he? And so Finney concluded that if we sow in tears and we sow in prayer and fasting, then we must expect that the harvest will come in. So he was saying it's not some mysterious thing. So no, it's the result of prevailing prayer that breaks open the harvest fields and brings forth revival. Don't forget that because I'm going to end with some things in this sermon, but that's the key. See, God said, my house will be a house of prayer. Could it be the reason why so much is going on that's not good right now, so much worldliness and, and backsliding and things not being the way they need to be? Could it be because houses are not houses of prayer, and therefore the Holy Spirit isn't moving real powerful, and therefore consequently people aren't convicted of their sin? Finney knew that if we earnestly pray, we should expect the harvest to come in. He also understood, like Wesley, I believe like Wesley and Finney personally, this is my views. There were other great revivalists like Whitfield that had a little bit different views, but they preach, they believe that if we preach the gospel, that salvation was a supernatural new birth and the need for being sanctified and living a holy life beyond salvation. So Wesley was the one that had three pillars of faith. And Finney took this teaching, and he used it also. He believed that we first had to be willing to repent of our wicked ways. How many would agree with that? Secondly, we had to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. It can come in no other way but through Christ alone. And thirdly, then we had to live a holy life unto God. I firmly agree with this. This is the way I preach and live and the way I believe. So Finney's methods, Finney was obviously affected by the Second Great Awakening that, we, that started at Red River and Cane Ridge, etc. He was mightily used as an evangelist, but here's the thing. As he began his ministry in the 1820s, Finney's ministry was kind of a bridge the second great awakening was when Finney, it was kind of waning and it came into Finney's life. And then Finney ministered under a mighty anointing all the way up until 
1857 revival, which I'm going to teach on, broke forth. So he saw two major historic revivals at the beginning and at the end, and he was kind of the bridge in between the two of them. All right, so Finney was very affected by that first, that second great awakening, rather. Um, Finney was Armenian in his theological view, which I've explained and put an emphasis, huge emphasis on man's free will, which I agree with. If man doesn't have a free will, then why did God put the, gar- put the tree in the Garden of Eden in the first place? If man doesn't have a free will, then why did Jesus come and die on the cross? I mean, either you're going to be saved or you're not. It, it, the whole concept here, if you pull back and look at it, God seems to be really big on us all having a free will to choose him or reject him, okay? Finney was really big on that, and I agree with that. So later on, Finney preached this. He preached the baptism in the Holy Spirit as being a secondary work, but it wasn't really time yet for that to really explode forth in the body of Christ. That came at Azusa Street. But Finney did preach it with some results, He felt the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, this is interesting for any theologians that, but Finney, who I I might add, was a very intelligent man. He felt that the baptism in the Holy Spirit was the answer to sanctification and would bring unity between the age-old divide between Arminianism and Calvinism because it, it is God himself and his sovereignty that would sanctify you. So that would pacify the Calvinist. Does this make sense? I don't want to lose anybody, but this is for the theologian mind out there, okay? That the baptism of the Holy Spirit was God's sovereign act that would help to sanctify somebody, so it makes the Calvinist happy. But then the Arminius understood that we had to yield to the Holy Spirit, so we still had a free will. He felt the baptism of the Holy Spirit would help bring us all together. I don't argue with that. As a matter of fact, it's an interesting thing when you think about this that God descended in the days of the Tower of Babel, and what did he do? He confused their languages and scattered them. Isn't it interesting that on the day of Pentecost, there was once again all these different languages, but what was it doing this time? It was bringing us together. I think Finney might have been on to something there. I remember this uh, one time this was brought out. A revivalist was saying that he's, he saw this. There were beekeepers. And they had to combine two hives. And there's a certain scent in each hive. So one scent is connected to that queen, another scent to the other, and they won't intermingle. So he gets out there with some talcum powder, baby powder, something like that. And he starts sprinkling it like in the air over one hive and then sprinkles it over the other. And the guy that's watching this says, well, what are you doing? He says, now they're all going to smell the same and they're all going to unify under one queen. Now, let me tell you something. When, the, when God's presence and power comes in, that was the thing about Azusa Street. William Seymour lived in the days of, of the Jim Crow laws, and there was a big divide between the blacks and whites back then, okay? It was significant. But William Seymour said when the glory of God came into Azusa, he said, let me tell you, there was no longer black or white, and there was no longer rich or poor. He said they saw people in expensive suits next to, next to somebody that was dirt poor, and everybody came together in the glory. The presence of God seems to bring us all together, okay? Now, Finney, some of you have seen altar calls, like at Brownsville. Remember Steve Hill? Some of you, if you weren't there, you saw it on YouTube. You've seen Steve give the altar calls. Steve Hill gave altar calls very similar to the way Finney did, but Finney was the first one to ever do it. See, before Finney, people would have meetings like at Cane Ridge, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit would just sweep in and knock a bunch of people on the ground, or they would weep or cry or whatever, and they would start getting saved, or they would go up to them, or maybe have somebody bring them to them, they'd pray with them. But Finney was the first one to do this. He would preach to a crowd... And he would say, if you want to get your life right with Jesus Christ, he, he expected that they were going to make a public confession. And I agree with that. He would say, if you want to accept the Lord and get right with him, then you need to stand up in front of everybody. And people would stand. Or he would say, you need to come down and get right with God. And they, they would come. But that was, you got to understand, that was so new 
that the religious critics didn't like that. Well, what's, why is he doing that? Why is he trying to coerce them like that, you see? Anytime you do something new and you're a pioneer, there's going to be resistance. And there was a story in one town that Finney offered the congregants a chance to publicly declare their faith, and the church erupted as dozens of people stood up to give their pledge while others fell under the power and groaned and bellowed. The evangelists continued to speak for several nights, visiting the new converts in their homes and on the streets. So this is really interesting to me as I read over this because I grew up in Pentecost, and some of you grew up in a way that maybe you also saw. I grew up knowing about camp meetings. You guys, some of you guys, maybe Church of God, you all remember the camp meetings sometimes you go to? And you know what that later became? Winterfest for teenagers. That's a camp meeting for teenagers. That's what that is. All of that goes back to the Cambridge Revival. That was the first camp meeting. Does anybody else find that interesting? Because I grew up in, in those times where churches would come together, but the problem is, and Barton Stone, bless him, he would roll over in his grave. His, he, <laughs> Barton Stone didn't want camp meetings with just within your little denomination. That's a problem. He said, no, we all need to come together. The whole point of Cane Ridge was the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and anybody else came together. That was the point. And then as I was reading through these historic revivals, and I saw Finney, and he was so in your face. It wasn't some little thing, bow your head. No, he's like, if you want to stand up for the Lord, then you need to stand up in front of everybody and pledge Christ right now publicly. And people, I mean, the fear of God was coming in those places, and people would just, they would rise up. They would come forward. They'd accept the Lord. And, and I grew up in services where I saw altar calls. If you want to get right with God or you need ministry, come down tonight. We'll pray for you. That all goes back to this time frame. Finney was the first one to do it. So Finney also developed what became known as new measures at the time. He allowed women to pray in mixed public meetings. He adopted the Methodists. They had what's called an ancient, anxious bench. This, is, this was like, oh, let me explain. He put a pew in the front of the church, and those who felt a special urgency about their salvation, maybe they felt like they needed to get right or they felt like they were unsure about their salvation, but they wanted to be sure, he would put a pew up there that people could come and they could sit in that pew and find the Lord. He also prayed in the colloquial um, common language. So Finney was not somebody that would get up and pray like, oh, thou that is in the heavens, hitherto and henceforth would thou. He wouldn't pray like that. He would, he would come down there and he would just pray in the simplistic language of the common people. He was there to relate to them. And let me tell you, these new measures of him preaching and praying that way and having that ancient, anxious seat and having altar calls, he was severely persecuted for these things. The religious people didn't like Finney during his day. How many knows that Israel always loved the dead prophets, but they always hated the living ones? See, now different people in different denominations will talk about Finney. Oh, yeah, he did great things, you know, but they were... If they were living in that time, listen, some of the very people that are religious Pharisees today, and some of you will know what I'm talking about. There are some people today that are critics of revival, critics of Pentecost. They're basically religious Pharisees and Sadducees, and they, they teach in a way that kind of goes against moves of God, okay? And they're always quoting and talking about the Apostle Paul this and Paul that. And, and let me just tell you, this is a fact. To me, it's indisputable. They love dead Paul who once was. But if living Paul was here now, given his testimony about being struck off a donkey, blind, spoken tongues, they would hate living Paul. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? In the same way, people speak so fondly. Do you remember Jesus when he was rebuking the Pharisees of his day? 
He said, you say that if we were alive during the days of the prophets, we wouldn't have persecuted them. And then Jesus goes on to say, then fill up and measure. Now, you know what he was saying? You hypocrites, you say you wouldn't. He's, Jesus was saying, I'm the greatest prophet that ever was, and you're about to kill me in Jerusalem. Hello? So just keep in mind that there's always going to be this battle with the religious spirit. All right. Most of these new measures were actually decades old, but Finney popularized them and was attacked for doing so. In Finney's meetings, people would be hit by conviction. I would love to see this. Finney would be preaching and people sitting like y'all are sitting, and the Holy Spirit would begin to move. I want you to picture this. Somebody would be in a seated position. The Holy Spirit's conviction come on them, and they would be so under this conviction, they would be in a seated and into a fetal position, and they would fall on the ground like a thud. And Finney had altar workers that would go get those people because they couldn't come down to the front on their own power. And they would pick them up, many times still in a fetal position, groaning or whatever, pick them up and take them down to the front and pop them down in front of Finney. And once Finney had finished preaching and ministering, there'd be all these different people there like that. And he would go to each one of them and lead each one of them to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I would you like to be preaching all of a sudden people just get in this fetal position under the power. You see thud, 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 thud. The zenith of Finney's evangelistic career was reached in Rochester, New York, where he preached 98 sermons between September 10th, 1830 through March 6th of 1831. So when he got into Rochester, New York, Finney really saw a mighty move of God there. Shopkeepers closed their business, posting notices urging people to attend Finney's meetings. How many knows it's a real move of God when storekeepers decide we're just not going to open today and put a sign on their, their door that says, we're not open because Finney's here. You need to go to the revival. They, I mean, they're not making any money. They just want people to go. Reportedly, the population of the town increased by two-thirds during the revival, but crime dropped by two-thirds during the same period. Now, Brother Nash died in 1831, and this was a great loss. And Finney, his ministry changed after that. So I'll come back to that. But from Rochester, he began an almost continuous revival in New York City as minister of the Second Free Presbyterian Church he soon became disenchanted with the Presbyterianism. Finney was never content with revival. I've never been big on revival. I mean, uh, he, I'm sorry, let me say it again. Finney was never content with religion. And I've never been content with religion either. How many knows religion is not going to satisfy your soul? You've got to have a move of God. And Finney knew that. And as he got in these religious circles where there were denominations and politics, he just wasn't interested in that. In 1834, he moved into a huge Broadway tabernacle his followers built for him. But this was when his ministry shifted gears. Brother Nash had died, which I'll come back to. But he stayed there for only a year, leaving to pastor Oberlin Congregation Church and teach theology. So he moved into more of a teaching role. He was an advocate for social reforms. He helped champion, especially the abolition of slavery. Finney produced a variety of books and articles. His lectures on revival of religion, a manual on how to lead revivals, inspired thousands of preachers to be more consci uh, consciously manage their revival meetings. He produced lectures on systematic theology. And his, his doctrine has really helped a lot of people to this day. What many don't realize is that Wesley's doctrine influenced Finney, and then Finney's doctrine influenced the holiness movement to come which influenced places like Azusa Street, which eventually influenced like the Assemblies of God, which eventually has influenced people like you and me. So we can be thankful for those that's gone before us that their teachings have influenced us a lot more than what we realize. 
Finney was called the father of modern revivalism by some historians, and he paved the way for later mass evangelists like D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham. All right, so what I really wanted to talk about more than anything else, see, after Brother Nash died, and that powerful intercession wasn't there like it was before, Finney's ministry changed. Finney went from, from seeing these great, blazing hot, fiery revival meetings to being more of a teacher, more on theology, which there's nothing wrong with that. But see, if you look at Finney's life and you look at it like a timeline, you could see when the intercession stopped there, you can see that his ministry took a turn. It wasn't that he did anything wrong. It was, it was just simply that that wasn't there anymore. Does that make sense? Let me tell you, the intercessors are the key to revival. And I remember that, I remember Jerry Hill telling this story. She said that her and Steve were in the Argentine revival there as missionaries to Argentina. Carlos Anacondia had begun his ministry in the mid-1980s. Uh, Actually, Sergio Scataglini, who was here, gave me a little bit more history about it. He said that Carlos Anacondia was a businessman, nuts and bolts factory. God called him into ministry, and he didn't really have a lot of support. But he went to La Plata, and he, he really felt to do this crusade. And Sergio Scataglini's father was a pastor there in a moderate-sized church, but he fully supported what Anacondia was doing. He stood with him. And he warned the religious Pharisees in his church. Y'all hearing me? He warned, Sergio said he was there. He said his father from the pulpit warned the religious Pharisees in his church. He said, you may have a problem because these heathen are getting saved and coming in here and you don't necessarily like everything. But he said, let me warn you, if you're not careful, some of them are going to be in your seat because you're gone. And Sergio said that's exactly what happened. But Sergio's father stood with uh, Carlos Anacondium in La Plata, and that was the birth of the great Argentine revival. And Carlos, they would, they would pray. Him and his intercessors would pray. They would fast. They would ask God to go before them into a, a region that they knew they were to go, but they would pray and fervently ask God to send his angels and bind up the strong men there so that when they came in, it was freed up. And they wouldn't go until they felt God had gone before them. How many knows there's a lot of wisdom in that? And so once he, they felt God had bound the strong man, they would come in, set up their tent. They would always go to the ghettos. This is interesting. They never went to the rich. Carlos always went to the poorest of the poor. But yet everybody would start coming to the ghettos to, get, to go to the crusades. But Carlos would preach, and he would walk up on this platform. And many times, some of the first things he would do is, Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name. I break your power off these people. And as he would pray and take authority over the audience, there'd be people that'd be hit by the power of fall out, and that some of them would manifest demons right there. And so they, they had uh, something that, you know, uh, these, believe it or not, this is going to sound crazy to you and I, but they'd have these people wearing little shirts, and they'd run out there with these stretchers now. I'm talking like paramedics. And they would put the people on the stretcher, and here they go. They'd run into this tent. They had a tent set up just for deliverance. People trained to get them delivered and freed up. And I remember when Carlos was ministering in 2019 in Pensacola and he began to move in deliverance. I went down because I wanted to see it and I saw people manifesting demons around me. But he had a powerful deliverance ministry. And, and so many people were getting saved at these crusades. He understood spiritual warfare, but he also understood to stand in your authority as a believer and bind hell's forces. And so as, as he was seeing all these people saved and these tremendous miracles happening, let me just give you a couple quick stories about it. I've shared with River of Life in times past, but some maybe haven't heard the stories. But there was an account where there was some people that came. So the story was that there was this home for, for people that, in this case, there was a couple young people that had deformities. Um, if I remember right, they had, um, what is that where you're, you have two chrom Down syndrome. And so they were there, and the moms, they couldn't necessarily bring their kids, but they went, and one lady had a handkerchief, an apron that she brought, 
And Brother Carlos and him agreed over that, that for healing. And he goes back, the lady goes back and puts it on her son. And right there, her son's facial features change from Down syndrome looking to completely normal. The other lady in the room had a child that had Down syndrome and jumped the lady like a street fight. And they're wrestling over the handkerchief. The lady overpowers and takes the handkerchief, throws it on her kid, and the same thing happens. There was a report of one person that was legally a midget and came to get prayer and grew a couple feet. <laughs> there were so many reports of, of cavities being filled with gold fillings that that was so common in that revival. It happened so much that Carlos and them had to say, if you're giving a testimony about the dental, he said, we can only do one or two of those. And so they had to limit people because that was happening so much that there'd be so it would take too long to go through all the people or getting cavities filled with gold fillings. All kinds of healings and miracles. But how many knows that when you stand in authority over hell and command hell to flee, that, listen, a lot of healing and deliverance go together. And as you're driving out the enemy, healing comes in, you see. It's connected. And so during this height of the revival, they had such a move of God that there were churches in Argentina that literally had to stay open 23 hours a day and facilitate shifts of workers because of the amount of people getting saved that needed ministry. There was, there was accounts of entire areas coming to know the Lord, it seemed like 100%. There were so many. And there's a lot of other stories I could tell. But um, uh, you need to read his book, uh, Listen to Me, Satan, by Carlos Sanacondia. Read the book. It's, a, it's the most inspiring book. There was one guy that came to kill the evangelist. He had a rifle with a scope. up in the, he, he had it pointed at the evangelist. And every time he went to pull the trigger, the guy said that this cloud would go in front of Carlos. He's just up there preaching. Is up there preaching. And the guy's out there with a rifle. And every time he was ready to pull the trigger, a cloud appeared in front of Carlos. The guy ended up going down there and getting saved. And there, was, there was crazy stuff that happened too. One report of a guy that was walking his dog past the crusade, and Carlos was preaching. And, he, and you know how sometimes somebody just yell. Carlos was yelling, ah, you know, and, and all of a sudden his dog like falls over like it's dead. And the guy, like, goes down, he's really upset because his pet dog and it died when Carlos yelled. And then Carlos yells again, his dog pops back up. Now, why in the world did God do that? Nobody, but listen, he, the guy goes down there and gets saved because of what happened to his dog. So people say, well, that's weird. Well, the guy got saved. And there was another account in the revival where uh, there was a guy that was so demon-possessed that he really was like a wild animal. He had long, unkempt hair, all kinds. I mean, his, his nails had grown out. He, was, he looked bad. They finally caught him. Like you would catch an animal, they caught the guy. Four of them carry him up. Carlos had been ministering to all these thousands of people. He was totally exhausted. They come up to him, and the guy is filled with demons. And Carlos is so tired, he's saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't know if I physically have the strength to sit here and cast all these demons out of this guy. And so he just, by faith, put his hand on the guy's head, and the guy's growling, screaming, and he says, in Jesus' name, I command every demon to leave this man right now. And stood in faith, the guy jerked and went berserk, and, and they accidentally dropped him. He jumps up and takes off running in the woods. And so Carlos says, well, all right. And so he goes home. Uh, later on, at a different crusade, this guy comes up in a suit, well-dressed, spoke well. I mean, he, there's nothing about him weird. And he said, I have a testimony. And you know what the testimony was? He said, that night when you took authority, he said, I ran out in the woods. And he said, for hours, I would scream and a demon would leave me. Then I would scream and another demon would leave me until I was totally delivered and in my right mind. And he said, I went back home. I mean, the guy, I'm pretty sure was naked. He said, I went back home to my family and got cleaned up. And now I'm serving the Lord. That sounds exactly like what Jesus experienced with the demoniac. I could go on because I love these revival stories. But the point of all that was that the, the intensity of that revival. So Steve and Jerry Hill were there. They were just in awe of what they're seeing and experiencing, the power of God. And so they went to one of Carlos's crusades, 
And one of the leaders said to Steve and Jerry, he said, do you know why these meetings are so powerful? He said, follow me. And so before the, the crusade was going to happen, they go back there behind the stage. So there's a stage, and then the audience would be out there, right? There's a stage that was raised up several feet. And he said, come here. And they go behind the stage, and there's a curtain back there. And he says, look under here. And he pulls up the curtain, and there was all these intercessors that were under there that were just like Brother Nash, were groaning and travailing for souls. And the guy told Steve and Jerry, he said, they're the reason that you're seeing that out there. I don't know how long they stayed under there. Were they doing that when Carlos was walking the platform? But that intercession was what rolled back the tides of darkness and also opened up the harvest, I promise you. The old timers understood this. It's like you're hearing Brother Ralph when he was here. He said he was growing up in a Pentecostal church. He would come in early before the service. There would be these intercessors in there groaning, or travailing in intercession. He said he didn't understand it at the time, but see, that was the key to the power of Pentecost back in those days. And if you listen to John Davis, I think that he shared this here, but he said that, that he was friends with the pastor at Brownsville. And John Kilpatrick, those that don't know, and John was asking him to come, and John Davis was busy, but Kilpatrick talked him into coming. He comes, and John Davis said that he went to the prayer meeting. They have prayer meetings on Tuesday nights like we do, and he said that the prayer meeting changed his life because they were so, he said they were so focused and serious about prayer. He said there wasn't any socializing. There wasn't people joking around. It wasn't a social event. He said they were there to pray. And he said that that prayer meeting was so powerful. And everybody knew as the prayer meeting went that week that that so goes the rest of the week in the harvest field. They said they knew that they had to intercede and they had to bind up the enemy and they had to pray in the harvest because whatever they accomplished on Tuesday night, was going to be felt the rest of the week when they had those powerful altar calls at Brownsville. I've learned personally that if you get caught up on that particular day, like right before you preach, you get all caught up trying to pray into everything, you can get out of faith. You can pray yourself into faith and pray yourself right back out of faith. And some people do. But I pray about stuff beforehand. And then when I come in, I'm just thanking the Lord for it being done. And then you're at peace. You just trust the Lord. Not trying to work anything up. Either God's going to show up or he ain't. It isn't going to be anything that I'm up here trying to make it happen. How I many knows when you get up here and try to make it happen, it's going to mess everything up anyway. So earnestly pray beforehand. And then start praising and thanking God for what he's going to do. And step in faith and believe God to come down and move. Now, I wanted to share this. This has really been on my heart. Churches need to be houses of prayer. They need deep prayer that will affect our nation, birth revivals, and usher in a harvest. And I believe that river of life has been, for the lack of a better way of saying it, like a womb where we've been interceding and groaning and travailing, and God's about to birth something. But I want everybody to, to look this way and give me your best ear, is I'm going to kind of close out with this, and I want to share this with you. Years ago, 20 years ago or so, whenever I really began to go into prayer, so this was, I think, January 97, when God really began to draw me into prayer, so 25 years. Um... I began to pray, but I didn't know how to pray. I'm not going to bore you with the same stories I've told before. But I, I was just, I mean, it was hard to pray because I didn't know how. I had my little CD player, known in worship, but I mean, it was just like, you know, bumping your head on the wall. You know, it was just, it wasn't there. And so I had to seek the Lord. I'm like, God, why, where are you at? How do I pray? How do I pray effectively? And so God had to teach me. Now, in that, God taught me something very powerful I want to share with you. <clears throat> Now, my wife will tell you, and this is important when I'm sharing. I want you to really listen because what I'm going to share is really important. For me personally, there's kind of three levels 
The first level is this, what I would call just a gut feeling. That could be wrong, but usually my gut feeling, what other people would call that is discernment, like you discern by your spirit. You're discerning this. You're discerning that. Usually my gut isn't wrong, but it can be because it's just my gut feeling, right? It's just discernment. Our humanity can play into that. So you don't ever base a life-altering decision on a gut feeling. How many knows that, right? But usually it's pretty accurate. But that is developed. I'm going somewhere with this. Bear with me. The next level is where God maybe operates through a person and speaks to you like an accurate prophet, somebody you really can trust, you know. That's another level that's higher than that. But the highest level for me is when God speaks directly to me. I do not say that very often. If God told me something, he told me something, it's going to happen whether anybody else believes it or not, I believe it. God told me that. There's been times he told me stuff, it seemed like it would never happen, and it seemed so impossible, and then it happened just like he said. But I had to learn to quit trying to, if God said he was going to do it, he's going to do it, but I would try to figure out how he was going to do it. It seemed like every time I was wrong. I said, he's, well, he's going to do this, and he didn't do it that way. He did it a different way, but he still did what he said he was going to do. But how do we learn to hear from God? Because we've got to know his voice. For us to have faith like that, we've got to hear from God. Once you hear from God, you know it, and nothing can deter you. You know it, but you've got to pray into it because the devil's going to fight it. If God said it, eventually it's going to happen unless the enemy is able to abort it because the person absolutely has gotten in unbelief or they've gotten in major sin and they've totally gotten out of the will of God, therefore it ends up not happening because of that. But if God said it, it will happen, but the devil will try to delay it. So for you to keep it on course, you're going to have to pray into that thing. And let me give you the scripture for it. The apostle Paul told Timothy, call and to recount the prophecies spoken over you through the laying on of hands and by them fight a good warfare. Wage a good war. So how God taught me to hear from him, some of it's kind of comical, but what I would do, and I'm telling you this because I'm, I feel like God's wanting me to tell you guys in River of Life and maybe begin to encourage people about this also. I began to open my Bible, and I would pray. Now, listen, all of us probably have reading assignments. I'm not talking about that. Do your reading assignment. I'm talking about hearing God. I began to open my Bible, and I, been, I began to ask the Lord to show me something. Speak to me. And he would maybe put on my heart to read a specific story or something. And over time, it started getting more specific, where he would give me maybe a chapter and verse, and I would look it up, and it would really minister to me. But, of course, in that, it's kind of funny. There's some funny stories in this. But, you know, I'd feel, oh, okay, and I'd get a chapter and verse and go to it, and, then, and that chapter doesn't even exist in the Bible. <laughs> so it's, it's hilarious. But here's, here's why that's important. God was teaching me the difference between my head and my human spirit versus the actual Holy Spirit. That was important. It was as important that I missed it as it was that I got it. Does that make sense? is I had to learn that was just me. And I learned how that felt and how that sounded that was just me versus the Lord saying it. And I began to journal things. God began to show me things, and I began to write it down. And I wasn't always real accurate at the beginning of this. I mean, there were times I missed it. There were times that I get it partially right. But through the years of this developing over time, you get more and more clear and precise that you know what God has said. Now, listen, sometimes God just isn't speaking. I think that some of the prophetic ministries, and there, there's, there's some really wonderful things, but there's a lot of things that aren't good too, okay? The Bible seems to indicate in the last days there was going to be false teachers and false prophets, and before you get an attitude, Jesus Christ said that. So take it up with Jesus Christ, not me.
But there's going to be a lot of that confusion. And as some seasoned ministers I've recently heard preaching, they're saying these prophets say things they don't come to pass, they're totally wrong, yet people keep going back for more. Hello? But as I begin to hear more clearly from the Lord, and it, it like is the developing of your inner man. The way you develop your inner man is praying in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Ghost. And as, as you begin to discern, in Hebrews it talks about this. It says through constant use. That's what I was doing. By constant use, you distinguish between good and evil. You begin to have discernment. Your inner senses of your spirit man. God began then to develop me in other things. There's times that I would be praying with Sandy, and all of a sudden, you'll know, there would be a message in tongues and an interpretation. You remember back in 2019 when we needed some clarity about some stuff going on? I'm not sure if she remembers what I'm talking about, but we needed to know some things. And all of a sudden, we'd be praying together, and this message in tongues would come in an interpretation to answer the question. So God begins to move through gifts. He also can give you dreams and visions. But it's the developing of, of that inner sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, to know. So I'm sharing all of this because as you miss it in your personal journal, that's not a bad thing because now you can start distinguishing, oh, I remember how that felt and that was just me. And then the Holy Spirit shows you something, and it's spot on. You're like, I remember that voice. I remember how that felt, and that was God. And so then you distinguish between the two. So begin to, I encourage River of Life and those that follow our ministry to begin to ask the Lord to speak to you and show you things. All of a sudden, a story may come to mind in the Bible that you begin to read, and he'll show you something you didn't see before. Journal it, date it. Pretty soon, you're going to begin to get some words from the Lord. Pretty soon, it's going to become more clear, okay? And I believe that the reason I'm sharing this is because we're living in the last days, and we need to hear from God. I've shared this before, but hearing from God can save your life or save somebody else's life. Perry Stone's dad was a real prophetic person, and he had a real vivid vision or dream, God showed him that his biological brother, there was a car wreck and a decapitation of his brother, and he began to earnestly, earnestly pray. I mean, earnestly pray about it. Try to get a hold of his brother, but he prayed and prayed till he felt that God had hurt him and it was accomplished. He prayed it through. And as he finally got a hold of his brother and they were able to talk, here's what happened. They were driving. There was somebody following them. And his brother, for whatever reason, decided, hey, I want to pull over to this store and get something. And he doesn't even know why he did it. The people that were following them were the ones that had the wreck and there was a decapitation. It saved his brother's life. There was a true story, Ryan Herbonke shares, where he was in Africa. Back in the days before, it wasn't easy to talk to people back then. You didn't have cell phones and sat phones like we do now. It's just... You know, he was out there in, in, in the woods, I mean, in the jungle. He had gotten a hold of some bad water. And, I mean, he was sick unto death. And there was an intercessor back here in the States that was woke up, and the Lord told her, you need to pray for Reinhardt. And she began to earnestly pray for him and pray and intercede until she felt in her spirit it was done, and God healed him and raised him up. And let me tell you, that was before all those people got saved. What would have happened if Reinhardt had died? Us hearing from God is going to be a big deal in the days to come. It could save your life, but it also could save the life of your loved one that you heard from God. So we need to know God's voice for ourselves. And the Bible says this in Romans chapter 8, the sons of God know how to be led by the Spirit. Now, what that means in a nutshell is this. In the Hebrew culture, a child before the bar mitzvah was considered just that, like a little child. But once they came of age, they became a son, sonship, maturity, a young man. And what he's saying here is that people that have learned how to mature, they've learned how to be led by the Spirit of God, to hear his voice, okay? And this is really important. So 
I just encourage you in your prayer time, it's very simple. After you do your reading assignments, after you have your prayer and intercession, your personal prayer life and all that, and you, and you get toward the latter part, you might break open the Bible and say, Lord, just show me something. I want to learn your voice. I ask you by the Holy Spirit, and get to know the Holy Spirit as a person. That your Holy Spirit show me something. Speak to me. I want what Pastor Scott's talking about. I want to know your voice. I want to have clarity. And God's spoken to me some things sometimes. I have really was going through something really, really difficult. And God would just come through. I've had times where my mind was all over the place, my emotions, I was nervous, I was frustrated, and God would speak to me. And I'm telling you, without exaggeration, it was very similar to the way Jesus spoke to the storm, said, peace be still. When God spoke to me, everything just calmed down. And he would give me the word that I could stand on. Now I say, well, regardless of the storms, regardless of this, that, and the other, God's told me this, and this is going to be what happens. And sure enough, eventually it was. So hopefully that's helped you guys tonight. But just take away from this sermon, Finney was a great intercessor. He also had powerful intercessors like Brother Nash and Clary. And that prayer and intercession is what broke open revival and broke open the harvest field. It was nothing else. Finney knew it. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word tonight, that your house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Help us to be a people of prayer and help us to make your house a house of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let me know as you...